is this thing on? Yeah. All right. Um, first of all, another public service uh, announcement. After this talk, just please don't run out because we have some free stuff for you. Um, so there's going to be like two more announcements and you're going to get freebies, which is always good. Can you hear me? Is it, is it loud enough? I can't. I can't. All right, good. So the inner HTML apocalypse. And uh, as Jon already introduced me properly, uh, my name is Mario. Um, I'm a researcher at the Ruhr University in Bochum. Some call it Rub. Um, I have a pen testing firm. Uh, we do consulting workshops, trainings, and some other things. Uh, I've written some books, written some papers, maintained the HTML5 security cheat sheet, and some other projects I'm going to talk about in 2014. And uh, I do like everything that is in between lesser than and greater than. It has always been the way. I love HTML. It's so complex. It's so huge. I love XML, HTML 2.0 until 5.1, where it meanwhile arrived. I love JavaScript, JScript, which is, of course, fundamentally different from JavaScript. I love Visual Basic Script, which luckily is still around in Internet Explorer. Um, I like to play with plugins, with ActiveX controls, with editable rich text, scalable vector graphics, math, ML, XLS, everything that is out there that is somehow in between these magic characters. Um, I've been uh, researching on the field of uh, cascading style sheets, scriptless attacks, uh, ECMAScript 5, DOM clobbering, and so on. What I totally don't do is binary stuff, so I, I simply, this is just not possible with the size of my head. I can't. Um, so I'm doing anything that is in the scripting world. And that's fine, I guess. Uh, I like offensive security. Um, talking about injection scenarios, uh, active file formats, uh, parser analysis. I really like old features. Like whenever I find like an old feature in a browser that is still alive, which is like from the 2000s, it's just like, oh my god, that's that really gets me going. Um, defense is interesting as well, but not that interesting, of course. It's just like blah, defense. Um, XSS filters. I rather like to bypass them. Web application firewalls, uh, IDS systems. Um, I've been working with CSP a little bit. Um, our future research will present like a very elegant bypass uh, that is happening because of a Google library. Hey, Eduardo. And uh, I've been working with DOM policies uh, with a trusted DOM. And I actually did my dissertation on the topic of like a trusted frozen DOM that you can use to give your website a little bit of extra security. Um, well, you might ask yourself the question, why is there another talk on XSS? Because XSS has been talked about like so many times. And there can't be anything new in this topic. Well, first of all, I think in general, HTML as such is on its way to ultimate power. We have websites, of course, like consequently. We have applications. We have instant messengers that use HTML. We have email clients that use HTML. We have local documentation floating around on our hard disks that use HTML, presentations uh, that use HTML. We have router interfaces, coffee machine interfaces, even medical devices. So there is like a URL that I want to show you, which is really scary. Let me just click on this and hope something happens. Oh, yes, yeah, something does happen. So there's like this company in the States, and it's called Spectrum Medical. And they have like solutions for their pacemakers and all that stuff. And uh, totally flexible and field upgradable via web interface. Like, fuck me. Sorry. It's just like, I don't want to have HTML on my head. No, just, just no. Anyway, uh, we, can, we can see HTML in operating systems uh, in, in Windows 8 and TZen. Um, and basically, the most important components that we're talking about is HTML plus the document object model plus a little bit of JavaScript and gluing this whole thing together, we have like the bait of great powerful applications, like very close and even further than desktop applications. And look at the freaking Gmail. Like Gmail is amazing. Like it's so big. I don't use the web front end anymore because I fear XSS. Um, but if you have a look at how many JavaScript files are actually being transferred from the Gmail server to your browser, I measured it in uh, January 2013. Maybe it's more meanwhile. And it was like 3.5 megabytes of compressed JavaScript. Like who wants to debug that? Like, seriously, who wants to have a look at 3.5 megabytes of JavaScript? Not me. Anyway, we can realize that HTML applications or websites are not websites anymore, but actually full-blown complex applications. And of course, the defense has also scaled over the years. Thank you, sir. Um, we have several layers of defense. Um, we see like network-based defense, IDS, IPS, WAF, server-side defense, mod security, and all that stuff. Uh, other firewalls that attempt to do something. We have client-side defense, like the browser-based XSS filters, which are quite good. Meanwhile, um, we have CSP, which is a different topic. We have NoScript, which is amazing. I use it myself. But all of these layers have this kind of attribute that you can say, like, at some point we bypassed them, then they fixed, and then we bypass it again, and then they fixed again. And it was like an ever-occurring game that, that we play with them. And well, it didn't really change. Like, we still have web security problems, right? So it didn't really accomplish anything in this field. 
Um, we have tons of documentation. We have papers, wiki pages, sometimes even good documentation, talks, blog posts, tweets. Like everybody talks about web security. And uh, one might think that those three horsemen are covered quite well. I know you might, of course, ask yourself, and it gets a bit kitschy now, who are, like, what are these three horsemen this dude is talking about? Well, I came to realizing when I had a religious moment that uh, cross site scripting in its three kinds is very close to the horsemen of the apocalypse. So we have reflected XSS. And that closely reminds me of the white horse, which is purity, easy to understand. You have some stuff in the URL, and you can see that, and it says scripter at one, and done you are. And you, it's, you can easily understand that, easily detect it, easily prevent it. So not that bad. Then you have stored XSS, the red horse war. And it's harder to detect, because you actually have to deal with user-generated content that is supposed to contain rich text, but you have to filter the good from the bad. You have to take, tell them apart and make sure that the good is going through and the bad is staying out. So it's a bit harder. And uh, then we have, of course, like DZ, Storm XSS. This thing, you can't really do anything against Storm XSS except for writing secure code. Um, we have this gentleman over here who wrote a tool called Dominator, and he's going to talk to you tomorrow. And uh, he can tell stories about DOM accesses, I guess. And DOM accesses is nasty. Because like I said, there is no actual defense. The only defense is not to have a bug. That's the end. Like, that's DOM accesses. Embrace it. Well, what is a proper apocalypse? And I have promised, I have been promised an apocalypse without a fourth horseman. And the pale horse in this writer was named Death and had his whole falling clouds behind him and so on. Um, so, Given that I'm talking about a horseman in XSS, and the fourth horseman means that there might be a fourth order XSS, like a fourth kind of XSS that you maybe do not know yet, but I'm maybe going to show you. Let's have a look. And out of the kitchen, let's get technical and see some code. Um, I'm going to show a lot of live demos, and uh, I hope you guys in the last row can actually read this. If not, don't be shy. Just, just come in front, because it's really important to understand the message of this talk. If you can't see the code, it's going to be complicated. I'm trying to zoom in, but we're going to make it. So, um, when we talk about XSS and we talk about uh, how to fix it and prevent it and so on, we need to talk about, about some assumptions, where it's coming from, what it's doing. Our first assumption is reflected cross site scripting comes in via URL, via parameters, maybe via cookies or posts and so on. And we can just filter that stuff, and it's going to be fine. Persistent XSS comes usually in via post, via files, uploads, and stuff like that. We can, again, go ahead and just filter properly. Install a library that is allowed or that is capable of telling apart the bad from the good in the HTML the user submits and only shows the good and throws away the bad. DOM XSS, and this is assumption number three, comes from DOM properties, like DOM things uh, arrives in DOM, uh, in DOM sources, arrives in DOM things, and then executes. Um, so we should just not use that stuff in an unfiltered manner. Uh, we should be very careful with the things, and we just need to create safer JavaScript business logic. But we can actually fix it, because we can see the attack, and something does something, and we can fix against it, because we know this thing. And that is crucial to understanding the next things, that we know the attacks, we understand them. So following these three rules um, that we derive from these assumptions, uh, handle uploads properly and set some headers right, we can actu actually mitigate XSS. So we can create websites that are properly secured against XSS. Can we? Right, we can. We, sh we should be able to do so. We can. Or maybe not. So let's first talk about this telling apart, like this thing with a persistent XSS, where we have to know, like, this is good HTML, this is bad HTML, the bad HTML goes away. Um, we have some pretty awesome filter libraries out there. So we have the uh, OWASP anti-semi, uh, and I think many what's called like XSS filter project. Uh, maintained by some brilliant minds, and it's really a good library. Like, I tried to break it, and I had pain doing so. Um, there is HTML Purifier, which is written in PHP, which is pretty good, but we broke it multiple times, and there is still one gaping hole in there. Uh, we have safe HTML uh, from a large company, uh, which meanwhile is quite secure. We have uh, JSU, which is a catastrophe. <laughs> don't, just don't even think about using it. It's so broken. Um, and we have many others out there. So basically, we have libraries that take arbitrary HTML and give back the good stuff. They're being used in webmailers and content management systems and social networks to make your profile now look nice. You can see them in internet applications and external applications in the www and messenger tools like, uh, for example, Skype or ICQ or Pigeon or wherever you take. They all use HTML and they all filter stuff and make sure that nothing bad goes through. You can even find them in mail clients, um, like for example, Thunderbird, which is also just using uh, HTML parser. And they are more or less the major gateway between fancy user-generated rich text that we want because it's so awesome, and a persistent XSS, which we don't want. I want it, but most of you probably not. Um, 
And so far, he, he wants it too. Yeah. He's, he's a good boy. Um, <laughs> those things are known to work pretty well because we haven't heard about like a major bypass in one of the huge filter libraries in the past because if there was one, shit would really break. Like big applications would fall apart and there would be like really, really big problems out there if there was just like a huge gaping XSS in Yahoo Mail or a huge gaping XSS in other big mailers and so on. So, but now we ask ourselves since we're attackers, can we somehow fool these tools? Can we somehow get around these libraries without doing anything that the library would consider to be bad and just count on someone else who's gonna do the bad for us? And can we maybe even bypass every single one of these libraries? Well, mean why we can't anymore because they fixed what we could once. And uh, well, you guess it, the question, uh, the answer to this question is of course, yes. And there is a reason for that. And this reason is convenience. This lady has it all. Like she has like the perfect kitchen, uh, white laptop, I don't know how she keeps it clean. Um, the white cup, and she's like, everything is convenient in her life, which is good, she's happy. Like, everything around her is built up perfectly and everything's easy and uh, nice workflows. So, convenience is a good motivator. And uh, for the reason of convenience, Microsoft invented a very convenient DOM property some decades ago. And uh, this DOM property was available starting uh, in Internet Explorer 4, so it's really some time ago. Um, do you know how many years this? Like Internet Explorer 4, like 25, 35, 18 something, I don't know, it's, it's long ago. Um, this property allowed us, or allowed developers to manipulate the DOM without actually even manipulating it. Um, but have the browser do the dirty work. So nothing, you had to do nothing else but also, for example, grab like a DOM element and say like, hey, I'm gonna just access that DOM element's inner HTML property, and you get all the HTML that is inside this element. You can read it, you can write it, you can do stuff with it, and you get around all this tedious DOM interaction that you usually have to do, like this, oh, do this and do that and do that. So it's like really, really convenient and really easy to use. And uh, look at this, like here's a nice example. So that is like the DOM way, the true way, the metal way, um, to just like pick the element and just like select the element and create another element and create a text node and fill this with stuff and append it, append it again, and then no one wants to do that. But this is the inner HTML way. You just pick the element, grab it, and just put some inner HTML in there, and you have the very same effect. So it's like three lines, two of which are not even necessary, versus 100 lines. So it's easier and more convenient. And the good thing is, there is more pros and even less contrast. It's easy, like I already said. It's fast. It's now a standard, so it's not even off standard anymore. Every browser supports it. Uh, it just works. He even has a big brother called Outer HTML. I don't have to explain what this does. Um, it's not always very friendly with tables, so sometimes when you work with inner HTML and tables, uh, things go wrong. It's a bit slow, but only on older browsers. It's actually quite fast on modern browsers. There's benchmarks you can have a look at, and inner HTML is really, really fast, even compared to standard DOM transactions. Um, it doesn't always work in the XML world, but we don't want to be in the XML world anyway. Uh, and it's, of course, not as true as real DOM manipulation, like you could see one slide ago. So if you want to do it, true style, true way, then you have to do it on manipulation. But we don't want to do that, we want convenience. Um, I wanted to find out who uses it. And uh, back then, uh, please Google bring it back, Google Code Search, I miss you so much. I consulted Google search, uh, Code Search and fired a regular expression, and Google Code Search told me like there is like 184,000 projects that seem to be using inner HTML and outer HTML, that's a lot. And then I asked GitHub, I said, hey GitHub, how, how's it going, how, how many projects um, how many files actually use inner HTML or outer HTML? And GitHub said, like, yeah, about 2 million, no, 1.2 million. That's also a lot. And then I crawled the Alexa top 110K uh, and asked, like, hey, Alexa, just how's it going on your index pages with inner HTML? And again, we found a lot of usage of inner HTML. Uh, I think it was like 75%. Um, of course, these values are a bit blurry, but you can see this property is being used because it's awesome. Mm -hmm. It's a good property. And. Uh, Another field of applications that makes use of inner HTML is, of course, rich text editors. Whenever you see an application that has a rich text editor, you can be sure that some code in there actually uses inner HTML. jQuery uses inner HTML, for Christ's sake. Uh, whenever you have something that is editable, content management systems, web mailers, email clients, they all use inner HTML. So this property is really around, and then it's good. It's not a bad property. Now, there must be some kind of problem with this, right? I'm, I'm not gonna finish the talk and say, okay, that's it, that's, let, let's go home. That was an awesome event. There is, of course, a problem with this. And uh, we, again, need to work with some assumptions. And we need to assume that, or first we would like to assume that what we pump in there, like what we assign to inner HTML, is in result 
same that goes out. So if we put, for example, something interesting in there, then we expect that the same thing is coming out. Which is, of course, not the case. It can't be the case. Because inner HTML works in a way that the browser has to fix stuff for you. If you're a developer and you, for example, submit incomplete markup and assign it to an inner HTML property, then the browser has to fix the markup for you to correct your mistakes and don't destroy, doesn't destroy the structure of the DOM tree. So the browser has to change things when assigning and when reading from inner HTML to make sure that things don't break. And that is, that is quite good. It's good for performance. Uh, it's good to fight off hitch. Uh, sloppy developers, uh, and it's just making sure that there is no illegal markup that can arrive in an otherwise sane DOM tree, and uh, that is actually what the browser is supposed to do. So, And uh, to be able to test this easily, uh, we created a little test suite, and this test suite has been available outside uh, for quite some time, and in this test suite you can just have a look at some examples. And now I really need to sit down because I feel like you just got to write some stuff. Um, let's take, for instance, one of my favorite browsers, which is IE8. I don't know, I'm not sure why everybody hates on IE8. So here's our tool. And the tool is quite simple because everything that it does, uh, it has a text area here, and then it takes the value of the text area, maps it as the inner HTML of like just a standard diff, and then reads out the inner HTML of that standard diff, and maps it into yet another test area so we can find out what happened to it. So let's go ahead and write some HTML. So we just start with S000, and then close the thing. Everything's fine. So here we have a lowercase s, three zeros, and close the whole thing because we're nice. And wait, here's a change. Something is different here because we see an uppercase s. So we type a lowercase s, but here we see an uppercase s. So the browser transforms it from lowercase into uppercase. Not that bad. We can live with that. And uh, this isn't reasonable because back then when HTML4 was around, uh, element names were supposed to be uppercase. So fair enough. And now we're a little bit sloppy and just remove the closing s. And you can see nothing changes down here. So IE and every other browser adds the closing S for us because it realizes, like, hey, you didn't close that thing. And if I take it and map it to an element and actually break the structure, so I'm just going to close it for you. And it's like, oh, thanks, IE. That's nice. That's cool. So you can even go like here and add this. No changes. And like this, no changes. And like this, no changes. Oh, there is a change. All of a sudden, we have like a closing B. But well, browsers do that. But you can see the browser fixes stuff for us to make sure that things don't get messed up by faulty assignments to inner HTML. Oh, that's maybe another nice example. For example, if you go here and say like diff, and then you say like class, and you have like an empty class, one, two, three, and you can see you have the diff, and the browser is closing it for us, but it just omits the class because the class is empty anyway, and to save some money and some performance, the browser decides to come on, let's not give it to the render engine, let's just throw it away because we don't need it anyway, it's empty. Fair enough. So we write then something in here, so like foo, and all of a sudden it appears. And uh, well, there's something interesting here. So we have like double quotes here and no double quotes. Anyway, let's just ignore this. So um, we can do funny stuff with comments, and this is actually like, I, I think we have enough time to do so. Uh, we can do funny things with comments. Um, just go ahead, for example, do like this, and then we close this thing, and A and then B and the comment appears. This is like an older browser, so we take like a, a, a newer browser, like for example, recent Firefox, write the same thing, zoom it in a little bit. Then we can again see, okay, we have the A and uh, the B, and there's the comment in the middle, and we have like two dashes here. But Firefox says like, ah, two dashes? I don't know, dude, I just gotta give you four dashes. One of, mm, okay, four dashes? Let's give it a third one, still four. Let's give it a fourth one, Hey, okay, that makes sense. Let's give it the fifth one, Oh, there is five, six, seven. OK, now it starts making sense. Let's go back. Six, five, four, three ends up as four, two ends up as four, one ends up as five, none ends up as four. And that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Because if you have a look at how HTML comments are being constructed, it's just like the lesser than, the exclamation mark, minus, minus, or dash, dash, and something that is commented out, and then again, dash, dash, and greater than. So. If I have none at all, then the browser assumes that there is a comment and automatically adds the two dashes twice. Like dash dash for the beginning comment and dash dash for the ending comment. If I add one, then the browser assumes, all right, this is going to be a comment and there is like a commented dash. So it gives us five, like two here, then the dash that we actually commented out and then two here. And then we have like two again, so the browser assumes like, yeah, what you really meant was something else because you really meant this, like an actual empty comment and so on. It kind of makes sense, like we can follow this this thinking. 
So as you can see, even with the simple things you can, you can do funny tricks and impress your neighbors. Um, now the question is, well, does that actually have to do with security again? Because we have to, at some point, arrive mm -hmm. at a state where we can say, yeah, this is some kind, some kind of a security problem here. So we have to do some history lessons for that. Back in 2006, um, a fellow Japanese desk worker noticed a strange thing, uh, magical, like really magical. So this dude was actually working on uh, some HTML and creating like beautiful HTML with forms and everything and writing stuff in this form and it was a good day. Like he just finished the form and then he's like, hey, I'm gonna send this form to the printer and just print it out and he went to the printer and they took the form and he was like, oh no, 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 because something was broken. And he realized that the values of the form elements that were perfectly fine on the website itself were bleeding out into the document, were part of the document and not the value of the form element anymore. So the form element was empty and the value of the form element was somewhere in the document and not inside the uh, input element is the value of it. It's like, well, well, what is going on? And I think he at some point uh, filed a bug and said, like, yeah, there's like this thing uh, when I print stuff and someone said, like, yeah, we're going to have a look at that and nothing ever happened. And one year later, Yosuke Ashigawa from Japan, a security researcher, uh, analyzed the problem and uh, found the actual first pointer to what we call MXSS, that fourth rider, that fourth horseman. And we call it mutation XSS because stuff mutates. Now let's have a look. Um, this actually doesn't work on modern browsers anymore, uh, which is good. Uh, it took us a while to get it fixed, but meanwhile it is fixed. Uh, it actually was fixed this year, and uh, I have an old version of IE8 here, and no, I'm not a victim of, and so on. And uh, let's remember we had this funny thing with the class. So we go ahead and say, like, for example, p class equals blah. So one, two, three. And we see it closes like the P for us, and here's the one, two, three, and here's class blah. But we don't have any double quotes, because double quotes cost money, and we don't want to spoil all the money. We just want to make sure that the browser is fast. So the browser decides to just remove the double quotes and make it a bit faster. And we're like, OK, if there is no double quotes, um, then theoretically, we can break out of this thing with like just a simple space, right? We just go ahead and say, whoops, and the double quotes are coming back. And the space is gone again. Double quotes are gone. We had a space here, and the double quotes are back. Like, hmm, okay, that's interesting. So maybe there's another vector. Maybe you just use single quotes. I'm just like, hmm, single quotes. And the double quotes are back. So the browser notices that I'm planning something here and uh, defends against it. And now I have a question for you, your audience. Um, how many ways do we know to delimit the values of attributes? First, no quotes at all. Second, single quote, correct. Double quote. And is there another one? Backticks, oh God, that's unfair, you, you of course know it. Backticks, yes, you can use backticks in IE, at least in older versions, to delimit the values of attributes. So you can do something like that. <coughs> what? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we don't need it, actually. We just need that, is, is that okay? So we need, it's, no, I clicked something, that was, that was bad. We need this and we need that. Um, and let's, let's just, I, I think I did something terrible right now. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, so, yes, Java version. Ah, cool. This is the right time to do so. Um, so, I added this to backticks, and all of a sudden we have an empty class and the attribute blah. So, this is like an entry attribute now. So, all of a sudden, without actually injecting or invalidating or breaking the document structure, the browser broke it for us. It's like, how is that? That is not good. So let's try to do something nasty with that and try with an image. So like image source equals blah x and alt equals something. Let me say alt equals, uh, alt doesn't work anymore. Class equals something. And we again see empty class, nothing happens. Then we add something in here. Double quotes missing. So we make this class empty and then we say on error equals alert one. That is how sneaky we are, and there we go. And this is bad, this is like really bad. Because we have script execution from within a completely valid attribute. And this attack um, that was not really published, like there was some spots where this was published for years, but no one kind of saw it. Uh, we had it on the HTML, HTML5 security cheat sheet for ages and everybody ignored it. Like everything out there was vulnerable against it, like Yahoo Mail, um, something that starts with G and uh, something that Eduardo works for, uh, and many, 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 many other applications. Meanwhile, things are good, and the stuff is fixed. So IE8 doesn't do this anymore. So um, 
well, this is this is how you should react. Uh, um, it's just for reference, if you don't want the slides. Well, it's pretty bad, but uh, it's not new. It doesn't work anymore. There is a patch, which is good, and it's totally not new, and it's really not new. Most people like it, but it's absolutely not new. But the question is, is there new? And yes, we have new, and we're going to show you new. So there's another thing that is also not super new, but pretty cool, um, and that is unknown elements. So maybe you take an older browser that is not really trusted to working with HTML5 and all these fancy things, um, then, for example, throwing an article or a menu or an aside element or a footer element at this browser might confuse the browser a little bit. So let's go ahead and again take my old, very old friend. It's like, hey, old friend, what do you think about accepting like an X element? Oh, let's just be honest, so like an aside. Like it's good HTML5. So like aside, one, two, three. And then we notice like, wait a second. So we have the aside here and we have one, two, three here. So it's just being completely swallowed. Interesting. So there is definitely like a, like a different execution path inside the browser um, doing different stuff. Because if you, for example, just call it P, then the P's appear. But if you call it aside, an unknown element in this very situation, it's not going to be appearing at all. So let's, let's be nice in closing it and just add the slash. and. Ah, hello. The closing one is here, but the opening one isn't. Sure. That's, that's expected. So let's add a zero in front of it. And all of a sudden, if you have some content in front of it, we see like, hey, we have the opening aside, we have the one through three, and the closing aside. So while this is quirky already, we don't really have an attack. But what do you do as a developer if you have an unknown element and if you want to tell the browser, hey, browser, um, I have plans with you, so here's some instructions on how to deal with this element. What do you add then? Of course, an XMLNS, like an XML namespace attribute. So you go ahead and say like XMLNS equals something. And strangely, let's just be nice at this zero. Strangely, again, this acts differently from class because if we have an empty class, it just disappears. If we have an empty XMLNS, it does not disappear because there might be something. There may be empties in good. And another another price question is like, what happens if I write anything into this attribute? Like, what's going to happen? Who knows what's going to happen aside from the people who already saw the talk? Like what's going to happen? Well, let me just, just write something in there and, and focus your eyes on what's happening here. Let me just write an X in there. And boom goes the dynamite. There's like a huge processing instruction, like a monstrosity. is like, oh, question mark, XML, colon, what? Prefix equals limited by rectangular brackets, X, and, and what in Christ's name is going on here? It's like, what is that? I've never seen something like that. Well, that is how this browser deals with unknown elements. And uh, if you look closely, you see this is properly quoted. This ain't. And we can just like go ahead and do like this. I -M -G -S -R -C equals. You know it. What's going to happen? You know what's going to happen. And there we go. So this is like the next attack. Um, this doesn't work anymore, at least not that easily. So you've got to be smart if you want to make it work. But the good thing is that uh, most HTML filters actually do not accept XML namespaces. Um, this wasn't found by me. This was found by Level 1 from Russia. Uh, but I found something else, which is also cool. So let's go back. And let's be not so nice and not close this element. Let's just remove this thing. And we know already, OK, we have the opening thing and something's happening here. But we don't have this weird explosion. Like There's not this kind of detonation of markup happening in our DOM. <laughs> but uh, there is another way to actually specify namespaces. And that would be using the colon syntax. So we can, for example, say foo colon var. And oh my god. All of a sudden, we have bar colon aside. Well, uh, interesting. That's that's neat. So, hmm, what could we do? Like, what what is the character that we can never use in XML namespaces? Like I already said it. Space precisely. Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh, we have a bar element. Ouch. Let's make an image. Oh shoot, we have an image. Here it is. <laughs> Oh, well, what's going to happen right now? You know what's going to happen. So it's equals x on error <laughs> equals alert. Well, and there we go. And I, I think we have to close it. So, no, where, what's, what's going on here? I think I mistyped somehow. Oh, no, I think I missed the, the alert. Uh, just, ah, there we go. Took some time. It's low internet. Anyway, um, the first one was new, the second one was new, and uh, you should react like this, uh, just for further reference. Um, so still, that's not entirely bad. A few websites allow XML and S. Uh, 
Everybody will allow article though, so if you have an older browser but uh, your filter allows uh, HTML5 elements, then there is like this kind of thing with unknown elements already. But in the end, it's not that super bad. And there's like some tricks to, to level some browsers into the right document modes, but we're not going to elaborate on that because of uh, timing reasons. Um, now, we're going to have a look at some actually real bad things uh, that still haunt modern applications and that still do haunt modern browsers and that you, as defenders of your web application, should definitely know when you deal with user-generated markup. Um, everybody loves style attributes, right? Like, style attributes are the best invention ever. Like, to take two languages and, like, smoosh them together and expect that nothing breaks, nice one. Really, really well done. Like, just inline styles is just such a bad idea. Like, ugh. Anyway, it's just CSS, and CSS can hurt anyone, so it's just like style sheets. And uh, surprisingly, most XSS filters actually do tolerate style attributes and some stuff in there. Actually, they go in there and have a look, is it really just color? No, it's just color, that's cool, let's go, let's go through with that. Um, but you have to really watch the content closely because many filters do accept things that do very surprising things. Like, we know from the past that there's like CSS expressions that hurt, we know that, we can file that away. We know that there's like uh, HTML components, scriptlets, and all these things, but we can file that away, that doesn't really work anymore in attacks. Uh, we can do nasty stuff with absolute positioning, just overlap buttons with our own buttons, well, that happens. Negative margins, negative borders, works in every browser, over overlapping everything, even breaking the position relative sandbox, anyway. But, um, there is something with style attributes that is, really, really, really bad, and it's affecting IE versions, it's affecting Firefox. Uh, the modern version is not anymore, and uh, even IE is very, very close to, to fixing this in the modern document modes. In the older document modes, it still hurts a bit. Uh, but there is progress, and uh, this is pretty bad. Let's, let's have our find ourselves a look. So, um, we go here and Zoom it in a little bit. I hope that's yeah, this should be still fine. Mm -hmm. And we say like, oh yeah, we have, we have an element, and so like, hello, and do it like this, and then we say like, for example, style equals um, color colon red. So this is fine, right? We're like p style color red, right? And I just have to make a little think it's full screen, but it doesn't realize that it's not full screen. But no, you have to force it to think that it's full screen. All right, here we go. So this is fine. Right, we have the style attribute. Um, we have an extra space here because it's just like what's being expected, and uh, the rest, I think, is quite okay. Now, we change to a different document mode, and we change to a uh, compatibility view mode, and we have a look at the same thing again. Again, we see, okay, this thing is red, but then we have, like, the uppercase P, and uh, we have uppercase color, we again have the space, lowercase red, and hello, and everything's fine. So, no, no attacks here. And now, let's think, for example, what could we do with um, font families? We can, for example, go ahead and say, like, font family, monospace, and whoopsie daisy, everything is monospace like we expect. And then we come up with like our own fonts, and we say like, hey, our font is called like foobar. And then of course, you can see we have the delimiter here, and we have the delimiter here, the single quote, and the attribute delimiter here, and the attribute delimiter there, and everything's fine, it's called foobar. Now, let's try to play with CSS escapes with the hexadecimal representation of characters inside CSS strings, and just go ahead and for example say for what? Well, this will turn into the uppercase A. And uh, while the actual markup has the escape, the inner HTML representation decodes the escape and shows the canonical form of the character. And this is like, mm, that's quite nice and more probably saves money, but might there be like a risk or something? And why not try, for example, the escape for the single quote to silently break out the string? And we have some Unicode, and we add the space, and all of a sudden we have, like, we have the escape for the single quote, but still we have the real single quote down here, and that means that we could just like 3B, and then we can, for example, say color, and then we can say 3A, and then we can say red, and then we can just do this. Yeah, there is a missing space indeed. And we can see, by just using CSS escapes, the inner HTML representation of the element's content will turn the whole thing into the canonical form, and the thing is red. The actual thing is black, as it's supposed to be, whereas the inner HTML representation is red. So we have uh, styles applying to the inner HTML representation that are not applying to the actual markup. That is bad. That's not good. Um, so if you, for example, go ahead and uh, turn this into something nasty, we can also go ahead and select expression. And I'm not going to do the alert thing now, because then my browser has to be restarted. I'm just going to set something in location hash. So once you see change here, um, we actually execute JavaScript, we select expression, location, dot hash equals 
one. And we close the whole thing, and we can see, boom, there is the hash set to one, so we have JavaScript execution. We can, of course, also encode this and just do it like that and use escapes again. And we can smuggle in our entire payload without even breaking the string because the browser is breaking the string for us. So if your system, if your CSS filter doesn't realize that this is possible and that you can have trouble with using or allowing CSS escapes in your CSS strings the user submitted, then you have an XSS. End of story. So um, there is, again, the old man who is confused by what he's seeing. Um, and the problem is with this thing that there is like many, many, many variations. Some of them have been documented on the HTML5 security cheat sheet for quite some time. Um, some of them are documented in the paper that we just got accepted, uh, and uh, you can look them up and just harden your application mm -hmm. against that. Some of them don't work anymore. Some of them still work if the browser is in the right document mode, so make sure that the browser can go into older document modes. I'm going to show you later on how you do that. Um, but so let's have a look at some of the variations that are actually quite funny. So we can, for example, go ahead and uh, let's go wait some second until the old friend is back. Please don't crash. Let's just use this one. Um, or let's hope that meanwhile the thing is bad. Please come back. Oh, <laughs> no. All right. Um, I'm very sorry. Just going to steal some valuable minutes and just kick it real hard. All right, there we are. Right. So let's, for example, go ahead and uh, just say um, P style and again font family. And then again, we have this thing and foo bar. So can we maybe go ahead and not even break the CSS string, but also break the markup and inject something that turns out to become a double quote? Well. Logically, we would just go ahead and use the backslash 22 and hope that it becomes a double quote. But surprisingly, the double quote is not becoming a double quote, but a single quote. Again, someone smelled the attack and said, like, mm, no, 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 this is, this is kind of, no, they, I'm not going to let this happen. So good for us because we can rely on uh, only the uh, backslash 27 to be malicious. We can also use uh, some padding and so on and keep padding and pad. Ah, there we go. So for the padding. So this is one trick. And uh, I, was, I was kind of obsessed with the idea of being that nasty that it can actually break the markup structure by using CSS escapes inside a CSS string, which is just like reaching through four layers and then there's like a hand coming out of the toilet and grabbing for you, just like, just being really bad. I'm sorry for this for this picture. Um, so I was, always, I, was, I was trying to trick with the string and doing stuff uh, uh, with the actual property value until in a fever dream it came to me that it could also play with the property name. And I went on and tried and used like a backslash and then you select the 22, and oh my god, we have the double quote. <laughs> so we broke, out, we broke out the markup with like a CSS escape, and now we can start over and do nasty. So let's just like three um, E to close the whole thing, and then three C to open a new one, IMG, and then the space and SRC equals, now we can't use equals for obvious reasons, so we have to go 3D, and then we say like X, and then we do another space, and then we do on error, and then again 3D, and then oh, this we can't do, uh, alert, and then we use the parentheses, and we have to encode it too, and then another space, and then we do this, and ultimately we do that, and we have the alert, gentlemen and ladies. <laughs> So this is just madness, but this is not really ap uh, affecting too many web applications because usually you cannot just tamper with the property name. Like there is some sort of validator in your code that says like, oh no, this kind of property name I'm not going to accept. So not that big of a problem. There was some other funny thing uh, that I also found to be not really exploitable in the wild, uh, but just, just interesting. So there are some properties where you know that they might cause damage, like font family, for example. Um, and there's some other properties where you would never think that they cause any damage. So if you go ahead and, for example, say like color, and then you say like color red, then uh, this happens. And this is quite interesting, because you realize all of a sudden that you have like this quoted string here, and uh, the quotes are being removed. They're just entirely gone. So you could, for example, go ahead and say like expression, and let's do the expectation thing again. Close the whole thing. Close it here. 
and surprisingly, nothing happens. So the browser realizes that this string is an invalid color and says, like, nah, that's not a color. That's, I'm, I'm, no, just, just, just don't even try. And there is another property that I really like, uh, and I found it with just simple fuzzing, because otherwise uh, you, you just don't kind of run into these things to actually systematically try to find out which properties have this effect and do this. And it was something that I never expected to be evil, and this B O R D E R minus ray, no, 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 um, width. So we have border width, and I'm not sure why it doesn't work right now. No, it wasn't the one. Um, but there was another one that were, for example, uh, hello, and there was filter. And you can see even filter just removes single quotes. And filter is not restric uh, as restrictive as color, so you can just go ahead and go to expression, uh, location, dot hash, one, you close the whole thing, and boom goes the dynamite, and you have the JavaScript execution. So the browser is just going to entirely remove the single quotes for you, so you don't have to trick with escapes or stuff like that. And then there's like another really not so nice thing that I want to demonstrate real quick, uh, just like, okay. Um, and that I realized when playing uh, with multiple font families. So for example, if you go ahead and select font family, um, and you select foo, you select bar, then you would assume that there is like a font family that is called foo space bar. Um, but you can also create like these fallback fonts. You can say, for example, uh, my first font and my second font and the third font. And if this is not installed as well, then just use some other font or some other font family so the browser can pick a fallback. And interestingly, um, in this ancient mode, IE is very generous with us as developers because once we use a comma, the browser assumes that this is multiple fonts and just removes the quotes for us. Again, so we have font family with a comma. The quotes are disappearing, as you can see here. Then we remove the comma again, and the quotes are there again. So again, you can, of course, go ahead and just look at expression magic in here, and then you have another XSS. But again, this is something that I haven't seen in the wild, so um, it's not really that bad compared to the other things that we actually can defend against. So um, there's other possibilities you can work with. Um, Chrome, for example, messed up heavily with text area. I think Eduardo found this, right? Eduardo, you still here? You found the, the text area bug, right, in Chrome? I think it was Chrome 12. I saw your ticket. It was you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Firefox screwed up with SVG like majorly, and you could you could do like this, like SVG in style, and then use entities inside there and create like HTML strings from entities. That was bad, but they fixed it. Um, there were some problems with listings, um, and uh, the biggest problems you can actually still find in all modern browsers once your page goes text x HTML. Never go text x HTML unless you have to, because this is opening a can of worms. You don't want to be there. Rather deal with all the HTML5 stuff, but never go XHTML. It's really, really bad for you. Um, everything that is inside C data will be decoded. Uh, this is the same, for example, with inline SVG. If you can't get your fingers off inline SVG for your website, just don't use it. Same with MathML. It's not mature yet. I mean, Chrome even removed it for quite some time. I think for the Cansec West, they just removed it, right? Because it was so crashy. Um, so well, the question is, who is actually affected by these problems? Um, Aside from the vendors that we reported to, most of the existing HTML filters and sanitizers, um, HTML Purifier was heavily affected. I think they had like six patches all over the place. Um, JSOOP, we didn't even report to those guys. This thing is too broken. Uh, they are affected. Anti-Semi was affected, but fixed it. HTML Lord is completely affected. Um, Google Kaha was affected, but they fixed it uh, after I spoke with Jasphere. Um, most if not all of the rich text editors that we tested were affected by these problems. Most of the existing web mailers are affected by this, like Roundcube is affected by this, Yahoo Mail is affected by this, and many others. Uh, some we reported to, but at some point it just got too much with all the reports. Um, we hope that the paper is going to fix something. Um, but the bottom line is that basically anything that obeys standards and doesn't know about the specific problem is or might be affected if some countermeasures are not in place. Um, here is HTML Purifier being affected, and here is Google Kaha being affected back then, but they fixed it. You can see the stuff is coming through with the backticks. Um, and here is the uh, HTML a lot demo that also looks quite it's affected, but you can realize here that it's like double encoded entities. And you might think, like, hmm, if I just double encode all my stuff, I'm going to be safe from these kinds of attacks. But of course, you are not, because if you access inner HTML once, you'll be safe. But if then the application access inner HTML for a second time, then it's going to keep 
decoding recursively, and then you have the same problem again. So you can have quadruple encoding and just access NRHML four times, and then it's going to be canonical again. So for your health. Um, yeah, this is this usual reaction when I saw this, this kind of thing in trainings. Um, and raises the question, like, how to protect? Like, what, what, what can we actually do? And luckily, there is a lot of things that you can do and that are not so hard to deploy. First of all, make sure that your website enforces the browser to only use the standards mode. So what you want to do is do not use the old HTML4 doc types. Throw it away. You don't want to use it. Use the HTML5 doc type, this thing. Throw out everything else that you have in your websites, because if this thing is active, all the nasty things naive don't work anymore, and you're fine. Um, avoid getting framed. Use X-frame options, because then you're fine. And you cannot be downgraded to, to another document mode anymore. Use CSP if you can. Uh, motivate your users to upgrade your browsers, their browsers. Avoid SVG in MathML like the devil avoids uh, 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 the holy water because this is not working. Oh, this, is not, this is not mature yet. Um, websites that have a decent complexity and uh, cannot just deploy massive fixes or significant changes, patch your HTML filters. Make sure that certain characters cannot be part of CSS strings anymore. Remove the commas, validate better, find a better CSS filter. Employ strict whitelist, make sure that only color and only this and only that can go through and no arbitrary properties. Um, avoid critical characters in uh, HTML attribute values. So they'll be back, tick out, replace it by something else. Um, and again, be extremely paranoid about user-generated CSS because it hurts, it hurts a lot. Don't allow your users to submit too much CSS because there's so many things they can do with it. And don't too strictly abide to standards because the standards are not made entirely with security in mind. Sometimes it just doesn't work perfectly with the standards. Listen to your pen testers, listen to your security consultants, and don't listen to the standards all the time. Know the vulnerabilities, you know them now. Um, and I guess for the pen testers here in the room, there's like a lot of bonus bugs. So, so when you're going out for a bug hunt uh, next time, you might actually find some more things that could be useful for you. If you find not anything at all, try the back tick trick and it always works. So. Share with you the huh? Share the sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Just, just keep, keep them coming. <laughs> um, since I have like mildly academic background, uh, I try to have like uh, a closer look at what, what other kind of mitigations we can install. Um, and I wrote a small script that is intercepting inner HTML access and uh, then using an XML serializer that the browser provides and uh, kind of sanitizes the markup on its XML level and then passes it back to the inner HTML setter and then actually sets the whole stuff. So that is pretty safe, but it's also pretty slow. Um, but you can have a look at this thing. There is a demo and you can download it and play with it. Um, but it worked. Like it mitigated all of the attacks, um, but the performance overhead was not so great. We described this thing in the paper too, so uh, you can have a look once it's out within the next days or weeks. Um, well, just make sure that you, if possible, don't use any C data sections in your website. Just stick with HTML. Don't use XML as like the, the uh, markup language you show to you that you expose to the users. And again and again, I can just repeat it, avoid SVG wherever possible. Don't use SVG. SVG is entirely broken. There is just like no way to fix it easily. Um, so we arrived at the conclusion almost. What's the takeaway? As a pen tester, you have like a new wildcard bug pattern. Like you will, you will definitely find more bugs in websites that accept user-generated HTML by using these technologies or using these tricks. As a developer, you have more and better info to protect your app. Like there is a new bug pattern that you can actually work actively against and protect yourself against. When I was presenting this in uh, Singapore at SciScan, actually someone from an Asian company came to me and said, like, "We saw these kind of attacks, but we didn't understand them. But we had them in the log." Uh, Unluckily, I never got samples, but he assured me that he saw these kind of attacks, uh, these kind of mutation attacks. So that was kind of a surprise, but also kind of interesting, if not shocking. The browser vendors have a new problem zone to watch, like inner HTML is gonna, gonna remain interesting. Uh, and the specifiers might have some hints for upcoming specs. And Gloria, Gloria, there is like an upcoming spec, uh, and there is like an entire spec that is evolving almost exclusively around inner HTML and it's being almost uh, maintained and updated almost daily. So you can have a look at this thing. You can contribute, you can criticize, just see what people are doing, how people are specifying this right now and make sure that these kind of mistakes don't happen again and that the specification is actually gonna be good. So, wrap up. Um, today we had some HTML DOM browser history uh, insights. We have seen some old yet undocumented or unknown attacks that we revisited. We saw some fresh attacks. We have a new pen test joker. Uh, we learned about some new guidelines on how to offense, uh, defend against these things. And we also saw the possible W3C silver bullet that maybe is going to be effective in 2015 or whenever. So let's see. Um, 
That's basically it. Credit where credit is due. Uh, main credit goes to Gareth Hayes, who unfortunately cannot be here because he's sick. Um, best wishes. Credits go to Yusuke Ashigawa from Japan, who did a lot of pioneering work on this. Credits go to Level 1 from Russia, uh, who contributed some of the vectors. Eduardo, of course. Uh, Dave Ross, who's here, uh, for allowing me to actually publish this research at some point. And Stefano Di Paola, who's just Stefano. Like, did you hear? <laughs> Thank you very much. That was it. I know. We were in contact. <laughs> You're actually immune to all this. Like we were in contact. Like uh, after he's talking Munich. about the HTML uh, sanitizer. Yeah. 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 I rarely say this, but you did a great job. It's safe. Like I couldn't find anything. So I hate saying this. My teeth actually actively hurt. <laughs> Um, if you have a good style validator and you use actual style tags and not style attributes, then you can do many things because this doesn't decode. Only if you use style attributes, you're at risk. So avoid style attributes. Like I said, style attributes, everybody likes them. Thank you. It's not mine alone, like I said, so uh, it's definitely shared research and shared credit. Okay, so be before thanking uh, the speaker once again and all the other speakers, I'd just like to mention that we do have a conference dinner uh, tonight.